All right, before we begin with our study today, uh, Dale, would you mind directing our minds in a word of prayer? Our most loving Heavenly Father, we are truly thankful for this privilege we have to assemble together to be with brothers and sisters in Christ, to share common love for Thee, and to be able to study Thy Word without fear of persecution, to have a better understanding of those things that You expect us to do as Your children. We're thankful for the good night's rest, and we're thankful, Father, for all the many blessings You've given us, especially the spiritual blessings and the promise of everlasting life, if we'll be faithful to Thee. We ask, Father, that You'd be with our brother John this morning as he leads a class in the discussion of the book of Daniel that we might have a, uh, a full understanding of those things you want us to understand and be with him that he might have a ready recollection of those things that he's prepared. Be with each of us as your children that we might always uh, walk and talk in such a manner that others might see Christ in us through our words and our actions and that we might always give you the praise and glory. We ask Father that you be with those of our members who are physically sick. We know of our sister Clydeen Coker who continues to have severe pain that she might be comforted. We ask also that you be with our brother Lansing that he might be restored to his health, that he can continue to serve thee as you uh, would have him do so. These things we ask in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right, we left off last week right around verse 29, walking through... Um, essentially what we're looking at is a great is a prophecy concerning the, the the oppression during what we know to be the the Maccabean times the Maccabean revolt during that time period I think Jason Maccabee or no no Judas Maccabee was one of the ones fell named Jason was the high priest of the time period when a lot of this was happening and and what we're about to get into is uh, Antichus Epiphanes However, I still don't know how to pronounce the name right, but we'll, get, we'll call it Epiphanes. Um, he was the one, in the whole study here, he was the king of the north. And he had been, he had gotten the, the, the reign and he had gone and fought some against Egypt. And in verse 29, we see a reference to that. At the appointed time he shall return, he shall go to the south, and it shall not be like the former or the latter. And um, we're going to talk about just a second here. Uh, let's see. I'm off one verse here with this. Right. Well, back up here, actually. He returned here. It says he shall return and go toward the south. But earlier up in our reading here, when we go up about verse 24, he had gone down to battle against the king of the south. And in doing so, in basically the Egypt region is where he had gone to, he had, had caused a great devastation and brought back much, um, right here it is, while returning to his land with great riches, his heart shall be moved against the Holy Covenant. And so what we're kind of looking at here, depending on what historians you look at, when he, supposedly while Antichus Epiphanes was gone on this campaign down towards the south, down in the region of Egypt there, um, the rumor developed up north back home that he was dead. And the Jews, uh, according to some sources, threw a great party. They were happy. And Jason, the high priest, basically began to muster his forces together to lead someone, if you would, a revolt. Well, the way they explain this particular section here, that when he returned back up to his land with great riches from the south, from, from Egypt there, when the Epiphanes heard that the Jews had rejoiced over his uh, misreported death, he moved against the Holy Covenant. And it was, it was a horrific battle against the Jews there. There were many of them that were killed that day. There in verse, um, Zerz in his commentary makes the point there regarding verse 28 and the death and the destruction there. And actually, it's Clark. Do you have your Clark called up there? Let's see. Let me bring it up over here. Well, Clark gives us some specific information regarding, uh, the, regarding the, the death Told, I thought it was right around verse 29 there when he attacked the Jews there. Maybe verse 28 there, where I need to be. Let's see if that's right. Um, right here it says that he was determined to take a severe revenge. Let me bring this over here for the people viewing at home. He was determined to take a severe revenge, and he had an ostensible, 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 there we go, 
pretext for it, for Jason, who had been, who had been deprived of his high priest. And this talks about he heard the report of, of Antiochus, raised his forces, marched against Jerusalem. Well, Antiochus brought a great army against Jerusalem, took it by storm, and notice there it says that he slew 40,000 of the inhabitants, sold as many more for slaves, boiled swine's flesh, and sprinkled the temple in the altar with the broth, broke into the Holy of Holies, took away the golden vessels and other sacred treasures to the value of 1,800 talents. He restored many laws to his office and made one Philip a Phygrian governor of Judea. Now he gives the sources where he pulls his crown. Now Clark associates that particular event with what we are looking at here within our context of verse 28 there, when he talks about there he would do damage, he would move against the holy covenant, so he shall do damage and return to his own land. So this was what we know to be the Maccabean revolt, or at least the, that, the, the big um, onslaught that led to that revolt there. They had already built up an army, and they were somewhat ready. They went in to take Jerusalem, and when he came back, he basically slaughtered them and just devastated the area. And so that's at 28 and then 29, at the point of time, he shall return and go towards the south, but it will not be like the former of the latter. And we'll talk about this in a second. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts? Is that what Josephus calls the uh, Jewish wars? I think so. I think so. During that time period. As a matter of fact, I thought, now I just looked at this at glancing, but let's see. He references, okay, I thought he referenced Josephus here, but he doesn't. He references him elsewhere. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, consider this. Look at verse 29 here. It says, At the appointed time he shall return and go toward the south. All right. According to what I was reading earlier, he sets about to go back to the southern region there. But notice that it says it shall not be like the former or the latter. Remember, earlier when he had gone down to Egypt, he had had great success and brought back many spoils there. But verse 30 there tells us, and I'll read this. He says, For ships from Cyprus shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return and rage against the Holy Covenant and do damage. So he shall return and show regard for those who forsake the Holy Covenant. Now some sources that I was looking at says that, now this is the New King James says Cyprus. The uh, King James says Sidim, that's right. Or uh, C-I-T-T-I-M. Yeah. Now they, what I was reading says that's essentially... C H I T T I M. Thank you. It says that's the Roman Empire is what that's referencing there in the prophecy there. And one explanation is that he set about to go do some damage. Some and let me catch you uh, specifically the damage there. Um, <coughs> he says uh, he began now in full to march and to besiege Alexandria, and within seven miles of that city, heard that ships were or that ships had arrived from Rome where with legislates from the Senate. In other words, what they did is they told him, you got to stop the war. They told him, you cannot, you cannot go to war against your nephews. Well, Antiochus said he would go and consult his friends, on which Populus, one of the uh, legis, legis, legate, help me here. <laughs> legate, thank you, okay. <laughs> Took his staff and instantly drew a circle around Antiochus. Now, this is interesting. All right, he drew a circle around him on the sand, and he commanded him not to pass that circle till he had given him a definitive answer. You know, in other words, he wanted his word that he would return home. So Antigas, intimidated, said he would do whatever the Senate enjoined, and in a few days after began his march to return to Syria. And so, and this, of course, he, he says here is confirmed by several sources like that. Now, he was grieved and groaning, that's pretty well clear. And Clark goes on to say that he vented his rage against the Jews when he went back again. And um, when, notice he said 22,000 men against Jerusalem, plundered and set fire to the city, pulled down the houses around about it, slew much of the people, and built a castle on an eminence that commanded the temple, and slew multitudes of the poor people who had come up to worship, polluted every place, so that the temple service was totally abandoned, and all the people fled from that city. And when he returned to Antioch, he published a decree that he should uh, that all should conform to the Grecian worship, and the Jewish worship was totally abrogated, and the temple itself consecrated to Jupiter. This is a great a great strike against the people of God. You know, oftentimes we think about this 400 year time period 
being the silent period within the scriptures. And it is because the Bible doesn't give us any of the record. But you, you're, we have to remember that the Old Testament was still in effect. The Jews were still God's people. And yet they were being persecuted, as was prophesied. All right, any thoughts or comments about that? This is interesting. And no, there he, he mentions Josephus there. He does, he does, right down. Right there. Okay. And it is the war of the Jews there, book one. You're right. Um, what is interesting about this, again, we're still looking at a prophecy here, but men doing a fairly decent job of lining up the, the structure of the prophecy with historical events that did take place. Up until a point, in a little bit, they're going to be taking a little bit of a detour. And a, a detour, detour if, I, if I read them right, we wouldn't be able to agree with. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Dan? No. Okay. okay. That was the, I got a thought, John. Yeah. <laughs> I was keeping my chin from saying. Okay. <laughs> Does it work? No. Mm -hmm. No, sorry. So then we'll all sit like that. Okay, so we have that there in verse 30. So he shall return and show regard for those who forsake the holy covenant. That's kind of the, that part, part there. All right, he shows regard for those that forsake the holy covenant. All right, any thoughts or comments about that? All right, let's look a little farther here with this, beginning there in verse 31. He says, And forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. And then he says there in verse 31, Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. It's still what to us would appear to be the con continuation of what we just looked at in regards to the, uh, what he was about to bring upon the people there. But notice here in verse 31, let me get back to that. There we go. Here he says that after Antigus, arms that were, that is, the Romans shall stand up and uh, basically, he goes on to say here that Daniel has described the actions of the kings of the north and of the south, that of the kings of Egypt and Syria. But upon the conquest of Macedon by the Romans, he has left off describing the actions of the Greeks and begun to describe those of the Romans in Greece itself who conquered Macedon, Illyricum, and Epirus in the year of the era of Nabonazar, 580. He says, 35 years after, by the will of Adelus, they inherited all Asia westward of Mount Taurus. 65 years after that, they conquered the kingdom of Syria and reduced it to a province. And 34 years after that, they did the same to Egypt. Now, we're getting to a point here, I believe. By all these steps, the Roman arms stood up over the Greeks. And after 95 years more, by making war upon the Jews, they polluted the sanctuary of the strength of the temple and took away the daily sacrifice, placed the abomination, and make it desolate, for that this abomination was thus placed after the time. Now, notice, but that this abomination was thus placed after the time of Christ. All right, Peter, so what he does is he basically says um, that Daniel now leaves Epiphanes and that, dis that description, and now talks about the Roman people, you know, how their nation grew, and he's starting to place what we're about to read after the time period of Christ, if I've read that right. All right. Then. Uh, <clears throat> uh, when we were reading from Daniel, he said that it, they would defile, where was it? Uh, yes, right here. They shall take away the daily sacrifices and up place there the abomination of desolation. No, uh, up at the top. Oh. Before that, where it said they would defile. They shall defile the sanctuary fortress. Okay, yeah. yeah. It's in 31. Uh, that kind of reminds me of... Uh, Ezekiel chapter 9, mm -hmm. when those that did not mourn over the sins of Israel uh, were slain, uh, they said that they defiled the temple by putting the, the remains or the bodies in the temple. They, they would fall dead in the temple because they were going in there to sl slay them, right. and that defiled the temple. So this could be uh, a reference to the bodies that would be slain in the temple also as, as, and also removing of the sacrifices and stuff because the defilement of, uh, of the holy place and the temple and everything would be for a, 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 someone dead to be there or blood to be there. Okay, all right. So go ahead and thought about that, these, connecting that with that. Um, any other thoughts? 
All right, now, let's look at verse 32. And I've, I've, we're going to step away from Clark's here in just a moment, though. But let's notice what else he says here. He's, our, he's now said that we've essentially moved, in verse 31, moved to after the time period of Christ. So he says in 32 that this, if understood, talking about such as do weekly against the covenant, this, if understood, of the Christian Jews, for the new had now succeeded to the old, the whole of the Jewish ritual having been abolished and Jerusalem filled with heathen temples, and he, the Roman power, did all he could by flatteries as well as threats to corrupt the Christians and cause them to sacrifice to the statues of the emperors. Then he says, but the people that do know their God, he's talking about genuine Christians, and shall be strong, shall be strengthened by his grace. Now this seems like it might make sense. The problem is, when you keep going with this thought, you ultimately get into what, what many people refer to as the coming or prophecy regarding the Antichrist, those who were against Christ. Now, Zer, in his approach to this whole section, he still puts it prior to Christ. He still puts it as the, the tirade of Epiphanes against the, against the Jews during that time period. And I think that, unless you know, there, there's, there's more evidence to the contrary, I think that would be more fitting to a prophecy about an event prior to the establishment of the covenant instead of a prophecy that spans into the new covenant and leads on to something else. Um, but I'm open. Any thoughts or comments about that? Because in here, there doesn't seem to be much switch, does it? So he shall return and show regard for those who forsake the holy covenant, and forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. It seems like a continuation of, of the devastation there. And continually, they took away the daily places and the abomination of desolation. Thus, those who do wickedly against the covenant would... He will corrupt with flattery. Think about the priests that he could have turned. Think about any corrupt priest that could have been turned by these leaders. Someone who was going to work for money. You know, and so, but the people who know their God shall be strong and carry on great exports. You know, again, look at the Jews and how they persevered, how they held tight during that time period leading up to the days of Christ. They held on so strong that the Pharisees almost took it to a point of extreme in regards to application of the law. Um, any thoughts? Now, tell you something, I, I, did, I remember in school looking at the time period of Maccabeans and everything. And I remember when I was younger, I didn't, I didn't think much about that time period. Well, the Bible doesn't talk about it, so it's not important to us. But really, it is in effect when you look at the prophecies found in the minor prophets and in what Daniel talks about, it helps us understand the landscape that was shaped prior to the coming of Christ. So. All right, any thoughts about that? Well, it certainly helps to explain, I think, the, the attitude of the Jews at the time of Christ and their almost universal uh, objection and denial of the Messiah. Yeah. That they had been so far removed from the law and the prophets that they did not remember the, uh, the prophecies concerning the Messiah. And it made it very difficult for them to accept someone who brought the proof that he was yeah. the Messiah. So I think it, it helps to show how their attitude toward the, the law was changed by all these events which were very dis disastrous to them. <coughs> they died because of it. And it, it helps to, it helps to, to form your attitude mm -hmm. toward the law. And I think that's what is seen in the, and we read about the Jew during the time of Christ. I think you're right. I think something else to kind of add to that it would explain why they looked for a physical king. Yes. You know, with everything they'd gone through, it was time for the, the true Messiah would come and give them world domination. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think, too, it gives us a, a, a negative example of, of, of what we need not do if we're oppressed and, and uh, cast down. It, 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 at any time in the future, if our country... Uh, falls and we are oppressed by whoever takes over or whatever mm -hmm. we have an example here of what not to do yeah. you know uh, uh, the Jewish people give us a, a good example of what not to do uh, in our service to the Lord and you know if you if you think about it like this life is just a, a, just a moment and then eternity is so long 
then what we do here should be in light of what we, how we want to spend our eternity instead of how we want to live our life here. You know, they were, they were thinking about what's good for them here instead of what's good for them later. That's right. That's right. Well, the yeah, example folks. of the rich man in uh, Lazarus. Mm -hmm. True. You have good things on earth, and you may not have good things afterwards. So exactly, that's right. I think the manifestation of the law was in the sacrifice in the temple, mm -hmm. uh, the annual sacrifice of the high priest, and so forth. That was the manifestation of them of the law. It was a very, it was a physical law. Right. And um, when Christ promised that he established the church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The Jews never could never see that with respect to the law of Moses, mm -hmm. because the very at the very center of their of their belief and their covenant was destroyed. That's right. No stone left of one another, and they defiled the temple and, and carried all the instruments away and that sort of thing. So they saw what to them was absolute, complete, ultimate destruction. That's right. And then even after Herod rebuilt the temple, yes. they turned it to a marketplace. Yeah. You know, those money changers and so forth. So. That's, it seems to me that's the difference between that situation and what we have as Christians and the guarantee and mm -hmm. the promise of the Lord that the gates of hell will not prevail against them. Yeah, you kind of, you kind of, right. like Gene said, you kind of understand uh, where they're coming from, you know, yeah. and their shortcomings and everything, because it was taken away from them. That's right. No more sacrifices once the temple was destroyed. With us, our temple can be destroyed because the church is the temple of God. A um, couple of hands were up. Rhonda, did you have your hand up? Yes, Michelle. Was this temple destroyed during the Maccabean period and then Herod rebuilt in the new in the time of Christ? That's my understanding. Okay, yeah. so I, did, I missed it the, until Jean said that. Solomon's temple was destroyed and then they rebuilt the temple. And, and there's a name for that particular temple. I don't remember now what it's called there. Um, but it was, you know, the time period after they returned from captivity. And, um, well, no, the, the one they rebuilt during that time period. Just It was a smaller structure, not nothing about it, like what Solomon had built. But then that was apparently destroyed during the Maccabean time, the, during the, um, when the, uh, Epiphanes and others had, had attacked it. Herod comes along and trying to gain favor with the Jewish people, he dedicates time and resources to rebuilding the temple, to, to restructuring it for the people. And hence it was called Herod's Temple. That's, that's the temple that was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. Exactly. Yeah, that's that right. was one taken down by then. The Zerubbabel Temple. The Zerubbabel Temple. Because he was the priest when the, pe when the people were led back by Ezra and Nehemiah. Or by Nehemiah and Ezra was described. That's right. Zerubbabel. Well, the Jews must have felt pretty special after going through what they went through, the ones that were faithful, mm -hmm. they, and therefore probably getting a little too zealous and thinking high, more highly of themselves than God allows. <laughs> well, now, here's a, that's an interesting point because when we think about the end of the, new, of the Old Testament with Malachi, what type of state were God's people when Malachi wrote his book? Were they having problems? Yeah. Even their sacrifices weren't up to, to God's standard. And so we can't really assume that for the next 400 years they were the epitome of faithfulness, you know, in servants unto God, service unto God. More than likely, they continue the pattern that Malachi rebuked them for. And while there, there's nothing, at least not that I've ever come across, and I very well could have missed it in prophecy clearly, but th th there's no clear warning regarding this particular persecution that would say, well, because you did this and because you did this, God's going to bring the day of the Lord upon you and Antiochus will come down and destroy it. Daniel is seeing is, and this is what's going to happen. The Lord's showing him this is what's going to happen to the people. Not so much the whys and the because, but it's just what's going to happen, but more to the point of the victory that will come in the establishment of the church there. And so who's to say it could be that the destruction of Zerubbabel's temple could have been because of their unfaithfulness unto God? That maybe they had they had taken too much liberty. Maybe they had gotten become too arrogant. Maybe they had done what their their forefathers had done in Malachi, and that led to that destruction. Um, and because even then, after the rebuilding of Herod's temple, we still see that they were rejecting Christ, rejecting the teachings of the apostles leading up to that. 
And still the people had not changed back to God fully in faithful service. Any thoughts about that? Where is it that we read about uh, the ivory beds and all of the luxurious living? Is that Hosea? Is that where is it? It's one of the minor prophets. I thought it was the one in reference to the northern nation of Israel. Um, but it could be Hosea. It could be the, the southern nation. But he talks about it. there's a contrast between the classes. You had the rich and the wealthy who had their panel houses. They had their, like you said, the ivory bedposts, and they had all nice things. But yet they were they were stealing from the widows. They were stealing from the poor. They were abusing those who had less so that they could have their great wealth. And um, that may be in Hosea now that you mention that, Dan. But I don't. I wouldn't recall without just searching for it, like you're doing real quick there. <laughs> I tell you what, modern day phones makes makes. Searching for things so much easier during classes today. <laughs> as long as the teacher doesn't take time to do it, because then the class slows down and everything. Um, so that's why I try not to do it a whole lot, even though we can, just because it tends to slow the discussion. But in any case, I think that's a very good point there. And so it's what we're looking at here is we see fundamentally Daniel being shown what's going to happen to the people of God over the next 400 year time period, seen several times. This one just in greater detail and with, with greater specifics there. All right, any thoughts or comments? In Amos is where it is. Amos. That's it. Well, where at Amos at? Amos 64. That would then be about the northern nation of Israel, wouldn't it? Right. Yeah. Uh, six four. he says, yeah, who lie on beds of ivory, down towards the bottom of the screen, stretch out on your couches, eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall. It says in verse 4 there, they sing idly to the sound of stringed instruments and invent for yourselves musical instruments like David. Makes you think about just wandering around listening to your iPod, doesn't it? <laughs> who, drink, who drink wine from bowls and anoint yourselves with the best ointments, but are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. Therefore they shall go now captive as the first of the captives. So it's they, even when some of them were carried off the first time, they didn't learn the lesson. They still kept kept going in their ways. All right. Appreciate that. Any thoughts? I think Dan's comment is well taken that we need to learn from this what not to do. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, and it's, it's, I believe that Christians universally are going to be under under attack and persecuted worldwide mm -hmm. more and more and more every day. And I think you can mm -hmm. see it beginning to germinate in the Middle East. That's a good that's a strong and possibility. It started out, I think, with the attack on the uh, Christians in northern Egypt, the Coptics. Mm -hmm. And I think it spread. And I think we've got to be prepared for that. We have to know what we, what we need to know about and we need to understand what happened to the Jews when they turned their backs on God. See, he's, he's, yeah, he, he's, he, we, he's closed his ears and he will not hear because of your sin. That's right. It's going to be because of our freedoms here. Absolutely. Our freedoms allow people to use our laws against us. It's like this Sharia law thing. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a big, uh, they filed injunctions. They know how to get around this stuff to try to force us to allow them to uh, preeminence in our legal system and they're, they're not ignorant of the, of the fact that our freedoms will allow them to get what they want and, and use it against us uh, as as a Christian nation uh, and of course our nation will say that we are multi uh, religious our nation doesn't really care but this was founded as a Christian nation uh, you know, air quotes around the Christian nation, right. but uh, they're going to come in and use our laws against us and take over. And it won't if the world continues. You know, if if Christ doesn't come again, I think in the not too distant future, maybe two or three hundred years or so, uh, the number of people will have to say over the lesser people. And then we're going to lose out, and we're going to have to um, worship in oppression. 
we're going to be oppressed by uh, the larger number of people. And I think that's going to be the nation of Islam, myself. Yeah. But I don't know, you know. Your name is Daniel too, isn't it? <laughs> it is, but I'm not a prophet. It looks that way. <laughs> I'm not a prophet, but I can see the handwriting on the wall. But <laughs> all right, look out! Whoa! Any other thoughts? Daniel's exactly wrong. <laughs> Dan, <laughs> the the thing that's going to happen is that Islam will be punished over the next 300 years or over so many years. This is God dealing with. These, these people who have a false religion. I hope you're right. Thank you. That's Thank just you as good as what he said. <laughs> 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 well, actually, now. And better. We like it better. We like that better. <laughs> well, let me tell you what. Yeah. I would almost, if I, if I, I could explain Lansing's statement better than Dan's. Yeah. And I'll explain why. Because, and Rhonda knows this is one of my pet peeve subjects. <laughs> But when you look under the Old Testament, you saw clearly how God interacted with nations because it was a physical nation of his people. But the church is a spiritual nation. The Lord, I don't believe, I don't think he looks at America as, you know, y'all were, y'all were my chosen people and no, now you're gone. You absolutely know? not. It's the church. And I would almost tend to think, well, when you look at the New Testament, other than possibly the understanding of the book of Revelation, okay, you don't really see where God is punishing his church at all. Matter of fact, you know, the faithful are always the faithful. Maybe fewer in number, but they're always the faithful. You know, Israel, whenever they went off into uh, apostasy, left the Lord, the whole nation went as a whole. The whole nation was punished. But the church, the church never goes off into apostasy. There are people who fall off, members who fall away from it. But the church as a whole never goes. And so I could, I could really see that if you look at God's, depending on your interpretation of Revelation, if it was his um, punishment against Rome, wasn't it? Taking the latter date because of the way they treated the, the, uh, the church. Uh, Alex Ogden takes the earlier date, which is therefore punishment against the Jews for the persecution of the apostles and prophets and everything. But either way, he's punishing somebody for the way they treated his church. Which therefore then might suggest suggest that if any religion grew so great that the church of the Lord was persecuted and oppressed the world over, that the Lord would bring vengeance upon them. Well, we're under we're under oppression right now through false religion of all kinds, not just Islam. Yeah. Every, everybody that's not yeah. uh, children of God look down on us. That's true. But we're not oppressed to the point to where we're near death. Where the church is so stifled that it's that that, that it's that it's it's being I don't want to say stopped because Gatesville shall not prevail against it, but where our liberties are so strict that we can't worship him. Now in other countries there are though, and that, that must be kept in mind. Uh, but if our prayer is to if we're to pray that we might lead a quiet and peaceful life, then I would almost tend to tend to side with Lansing in that if we ever got so bad that some religion was was choking the church of God and his followers, that the Lord, if he chose to, would do something through his providence about that. Well, we're not the only infidel. No, we're not. Everybody that's not Islam is an infidel. It's not just the church of Christ. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is they have the numbers. And, it's, that's, and that's what Jesus pointed out. They, it's a growing religion. They have the numbers, and we need to fear that. Yeah. I mean, uh, as a nation, not necessarily as Christians. Yeah. We don't have anything to fear as Christians, but but as a nation, we need to fear that. Well, I I, 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 don't, I don't know who the nation itself should fear more, the likes of Islamic religion or the worldliness that's going on already. Now, I'm not saying Islam would be better. Don't misunderstand me because of how strict they apply the law. But on the news this morning, they were talking about teenagers and, and, and the extremes are going to now with the computers and texting and all that. I mean, we... It, I, was, I was listening to NPR the other day and, and it was fresh air and they were interviewing two guys who wrote some series on HBO and come to find out these two guys have been married for years and they, 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 they're all for staying monogamous <laughs> I mean it was it was so strange but and it's I think that is going to be a greater threat in some ways but well it, it is our own progressive government this uh, our own progressive government yeah. 
the people that can slip in unaware, unbeknownst to us, slip in and and try to uh, uh, change uh, uh, true worship are to be feared as much as someone who's going to take your life. At least you know what uh, they're going to do. They're going to kill you if they can. Yeah. If, if, if it's possible and they can get away with it, or even if they aren't worried about getting away with it. But their uh, uh, object or their objective is to, by force or by deception, change the world into an Islamic world. That's their agenda. That's what they. That's what they uh, are are trying to do, and you know these other people that think, okay, we'll just see if we can get women to to teach, you know, uh, cre- uh, male Christians in this congregation, or the, it, maybe we can get two services where we can play the instrument in one service and the other service not, or whatever. They're the ones that are sneaking in doing it, and we need fear them too. I'm not saying that our only fear is. Islam, but we have to keep our eyes open. We have to keep our eyes place. open for that because they have the numbers. Mm-hmm. They're uh, they're the most populous religion, I think, mm-hmm. that there is. Maybe uh, uh, next to the Roman Catholics, I'm not sure mm-hmm. who's the biggest now. Well, Dell made the point a while ago, though, in regards to our government. You only you only the problem is when you let people walk over you. When 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 you willingly and knowingly let those changes in. Gene yeah. and then Rhonda. Sure. What, what we must do, we must not, must not, repeat not, lose faith. There you go. Absolutely. The, uh, during the <laughs> Middle Ages, the church literally disappeared from public view. Right. Yet following that, the Reformation was the strongest growth of the church ever recorded in, yeah. since, the, since the first first century. And looking at history a little bit, the strongest, most powerful Islamic empire was the, were the Ottomans. In 1924, they were destroyed. Yeah. Internally by corruption uh, and from the outside, but they were destroyed. So mm-hmm. that's, uh, you can't lose faith in what the scriptures teach that the church will not lose. It will not. Prevail, will not prevail against it. Exactly. And as long as we remain faithful and, and we can teach underground, and that's it's, the first time. That's right. As for me and my that's house, right. I will serve so You make the determination. <laughs> Whatever the setting is, you keep serving him faithfully. Right. Yeah. Rhonda. I was just going to say that Satan has many agents. You know, mm-hmm. it, it could be the agent of the false religion. It could be the mm-hmm. agent of our own government. It could be the agent of immorality. Mm-hmm. And so we have to be willing to make a stand against any of his devices. Yeah. Because he'll get us, if he, if, we're not fearful of some other religion coming in, and, but yet we're, you know, we're not watching that, then he'll use that. Maybe we're not watching the immorality that's creeping in, mm-hmm. then he's going to use that. He's going to use any agent possible to try to get us to lose faith. Like and, cracking your windshield. Yeah. Yes, it creeps. Yeah. He creeps in any way he can. Now, I'll, I'll throw one more thought out, and then we're going to read the rest of this chapter here and kind of briefly look at it. But, Dan, I'm, I'm on fight. You were talking about the, the, the goal of, of the Islams, okay? You know, when, when you step back in a very um, unbiased way and look at that, you can understand what their goal is. Because isn't that our goal? That's our goal. It yeah. The, the only difference is their, their religion is a government. And so when they spread their religion, they spread their government. And they apply it upon all. With us, we're trying to spread the kingdom of Christ. Um, and so it's, it's like any other religious group. You know, the Jehovah's Witness wants to make everybody Jehovah's Witness, and the Mormons wants to make everybody Mormons. The difference is, is which one poses fundamentally a greater threat to our being able to serve the Lord. And, yeah. and they, and uh, their dogma says that they can lie to achieve what they need. They can kill to achieve what they desire. That's in, yes. that's in their book. Yeah. Our book doesn't tell us we can kill to uh, make people Christians. That's right. Exactly. We can't lie to them to make them Christians. Mm-hmm. So th- th- that's another difference in it. You know, they they can go to any bounds to uh, promote Islam. That's right. We cannot. You know, we have to preach the truth. 
or we get to preach the truth. Let me put it that way. We <laughs> have to. We get to. Yeah. As one great person one time said, I saw the enemy face to face and it was I. Yeah, yeah. there you go. That's it. And that's, that's, that's the one we've got to fear right there. That's right. Well said, Dale. And the second one was your spouse. <laughs> Not well said. Uh, no. <laughs> that's right, exactly. Um, and in the end, that's what we see within the scriptures. It's not so much the devil we have to worry about, it's our own selves following. Exactly. You give me Okay. Well, let's read a little bit more. What we're gonna we're gonna read now through the rest of the chapter, and we're not gonna try to explain everything. There are, there are quotes from several different sources about laying this out. But what we're about to look at is the, the concluding of chapter 11, Daniel's prophecy regarding this time period. Like I said, I want to put what we're looking at here prior to the death of Christ. It makes more sense that it's prior to the coming of the church and the coming of the church be the great victory as seen in the other prophecies. Um, so let's start reading there in verse, um, let's start in verse 33. And let, let's start in the back tonight, this morning. And we'll start with Miss Pat over here. Would you read for us in Daniel 11, start in verse 33, and let's read through verse 35, please. And so the people who understood shall instruct many, yet for many days they shall fall by the sword and flame by captivity and plundering. Now when they fall, they shall be aided with a little help, but many shall join in will join with them by intrigue, and some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white until the time of the end, because it, it is still for the appointed time. Okay. Now, you think about that, I can clearly see that talking about the, 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 the faithful of the Jews who were listening to the words of Jesus, who were receptive to the word, not the ones whose hearts had been hardened, but the ones who were willing to listen and learn. Um, and there was still persecution, but some of them would be helped, some of them would be kept, and we see them there when Christ walked the earth, listening to him, following him. All right, Rhonda, let's start in verse 36 there, and let's read from 36, let's go and read down through verse 39, please. Then the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished, for what has been determined shall be done. He shall regard neither the god of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any god, for he shall exalt himself above, all, above them all. But in their place he shall honor a god of fortress, a god with which his fathers did not know, he shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus he shall act against the strongest fortress with a foreign god, which he shall acknowledge and advance its glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land for gain. Okay. Now let's back up here for just a moment. Now this one, when you hit verse 36, there, if I remember it correctly, still holds the position that the king he's talking about is still Epiphanes, it's still Antipas uh, Epiphanes there with that. Um, he's, I, want to, I want to confirm that. Yeah. He says the king is still Epiphanes, which, uh, whose wicked doings we have been observing through many. Um, Clark, on the other hand, just kind of bring this just to the light here. He says this may apply to Antipas Epiphanes, who exalts himself above every god, called himself a god, sported with all religion, profane. But others think an anti-Christian power in the church is intended. For in the language of this prophecy, king is taken for power, hence a kingdom, that such a power did spring up in the church that acted in an arbitrary manner against all laws, human and divine, is well known. This power showed itself in the Greek emperors in the east and the bishops of Rome in the west, and this is to continue. So, he, he says it's possible that it's still Antichus Pippinus. And that's what Zer, Zer tends to think that it is. Um, but he acknowledges that other people view an anti-Christian power arising from that. I, like I said a while ago, I still think that it fits the, the, all the patterns of the prophecies that we've looked at if we keep this pre-establishment of the church. 
because then the church is the, the, the great thing that is established there. All right, any, um, any thoughts about that? He continues with the thoughts here. You know, he, um, he would raise himself up as a god. Now, I will say that Paul, in his letter to the Thessalonica, <laughs> the brethren of Thessalonia, Thessalonica, <coughs> Thessalonians, um, he does prophesy of, of one who would essentially, what many say was the coming of the Pope, who essentially would put himself up as a position of God. But I don't think this is one and the same. I think this is, this is still talking about the same one who's wreaking havoc upon the Jewish people there. All right, any thoughts? All right, let's see. Uh, let's start with verse 40. And Rose, would you mind reading for us verses 40 through 42, please? At the time the end of the king of the south shall attack him, the king of the north shall come against him like a woman, with chariots, horsemen, and many ships. He shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. He shall also enter the glorious land, and many countries shall be on the throne. But these shall escape from his hand, Edom, Moab, and the permitted people of Emmon. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. All right, now, if you, if you thought to yourself that those verses sounded somewhat familiar, those verses, 40, 41, and 42, were also... They are quoted from chapter 8, 24, and 25. Okay, so essentially the same wording there. And so he's placing this, or at least the way that it, it would way that it is unfolding here, that it's still the same battle between the north and the south, between the northern king and the southern king, and the persecution <coughs> taking place and affecting even into the region of Judah there. And you'll note that he shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. Um, verse 43 through the end, Dan, if you would. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over the precious things of Egypt. Also, the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall fall <coughs> at his heels. But news from the east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. And he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him. Now the he there seems to be talking about the same king under question, that one great king. Um, I'll share with you what, what Zer says regarding this, this last section here. He says, briefly summing up, Epiphanes was madly pursuing his attacks in the south when he learned of the disturbances going on in another part of his dominions. In his fury, he started thither, determined to wreak severe vengeance upon the Jews, whom he blamed for most of the disturbances. But he was not suffered to carry out his wicked designs. In the midst of his mad performances, he was smitten by the Lord and finally died in a most shameful and loathsome manner. In this way, he fulfilled the prediction, yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. So kind of, kind of pulls, pulls the summation of that together. Okay, any thoughts or comments? Oftentimes, and this, this is not always true of biblical studies, but there is a, a, a saying when, when you're talking about mysteries, and so often razors, is typically what is the simplest solution tends to be the right one. You can't always say that in studies of the Bible, obviously. But I think in this one right here, when you simply line it up with historical events, that seems to be the simplest explanation. Daniel, and this was a vision to Daniel about what was to come for his people. And you could see when, when you read through something like this, how the vision would make Daniel sick. You know, we kind of read about that in, um, when, when we went, when <coughs> Daniel was three weeks in depression and prayer and in fasting when he saw this vision. And we can understand that, Daniel. I think it's interesting to uh, see that uh, throughout history, that during the times of great oppression, that there was some apocalyptic writings that uh, known only to those, uh, or better known to those that had to do with it. You know, uh, uh, like John's revelation. You know, that, uh, that's very apocalyptic. It's, it's, it's meant for them to understand, and it's difficult for us to understand, as is this, you know, when these 
uh, when they were going through this, uh, the uh, God's people were going through the same type of oppression here mm -hmm. and mistreatment as they were later on in, uh, in Revelation. That's a good point. And, and in each, in the, by the two comparisons there you're talking about, ultimately comfort is given when they know that what their people are going through will not always last. Uh, the book of Revelation, one of the best ways, I think, one of the simplest ways to look at it is victory in Christ. You know, with what they were going through during the current day and the persecution that was going taking place, in the end, it's what we've already said here earlier. Their key was to stay faithful. It's and like they the, would have victory. The, the joy and the peace we get from reading scriptures like God is not slack concerning this promise. You know, uh, mm -hmm. we were, we're reading what they ask. Where is this coming? You know, where, where's this coming that we have been told about? Where is it? And then God is not slack con concerning his promise to us, but it's long-suffering that not wishing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. It's, it's telling them, just be patient, you know, uh, uh, keep doing good, do, do not uh, grow weary in doing good, and and uh, God's not slack concerning His promise. He's going He's going to do what He promised. That's right. And uh, so it gives us hope and it gives us peace to uh, read stuff like that. And that's for us. You know, it was written to them, but it's for us. That's right. During the life of Christ, what was the, the big great event that fundamentally? Now, I'm not talking about the establishment of the church, but the, the the great event that was foretold. You know, not really an apocalyptic event, but it was going to be pretty much that. Well, more the destruction of Jerusalem. Right. Okay, destruction of Jerusalem. Um, however, on the other side of that, well, not really on the other side of it, but at the establishment of the church, the, the, the apostles weren't really looking towards that obstacle, although the Hebrew writer may have been referencing that. He says it's so much the more when you see the day approaching. Some say that may be the destruction of Jerusalem. But... When you, when you look at, at 1 Corinthians 15, you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, you look at 2 Peter chapter 3, these are all looking at, you know, there, there is now a singular event that we are focused on. It's not the destruction of Jerusalem, but it's the coming of the Lord. And that's, that's what we still look towards. There, look. there can be three things referenced in that, I think, three, uh, as much the more as you see the day approaching. Mm -hmm. Either the first day of the week, Mm -hmm. Or the second coming of Christ, the day the day of judgment. Yeah. Uh, I, I kind of discount the destruction of Jerusalem in that. I, I know there are a lot of educated people that say that, but uh, I think the other two uh, have more to it. But in, in well, but and the judgment day even more so. I think you know that for us that's the way we read that the day of judgment as we see the day of his return, because he, even looking at worship. He says, you know, forsake not the assembly of yourselves together as is the matter of some. Well, if that was the first day of the week was the day, that would imply they had assemblies during the course of the week as right. they saw that day approaching. Well, the, the, but, but for us, though, I think what, what you're saying is true, though. We focus on his return. But that calling thing. people and preparing them, getting them ready yeah. for the Lord's day, it, uh, it, that's the application I would make in that. And that is interesting. Okay, so instead of as much the more as you see the day uh, approaching throughout the week, you're going to contact them. You know, uh, these people who are forsaking the assembly, call them up and get them ready. Tell them, say, hey, you know, Lord's Day's coming. Or, like I said, the uh, uh, Judgment Day. Yeah. And that's the day uh, in the New Testament. Yeah. And that, that to me, the, is the greatest of applications. I think so. We and it, I don't think it'd do harm to the scriptures to, uh, to say it could mean. Oh, yeah. It could mean if we don't know. So. Yeah. Um, any thoughts? Many times in Bible studies, you do see a primary application, then you see a secondary application. The only thing is you want to stay away from is secondary doctrinal teachings. Right. You know, trying to extrapolate out of it. But you do see other applications, you know. So. Okay. Well, any final thoughts on Daniel 11? All right. Let's plan next... Tuesday to do the questions for Daniel 11. We'll walk through those and then go ahead and have the questions ready for Daniel 12 and we'll read through this last chapter and uh, look at what the, the Lord has to say to Daniel as he tells him to, to uh, shut the book up until the end of time is there 
and we'll see the final thoughts there and the final things that Daniel sees. Any other thoughts or comments or questions? Okay. I appreciate everybody's participation, and I appreciate your patience through this, because this is a little bit different, because we had to look at some historical events, and you know, every book of the Bible has its own challenges and things that we have to learn from it and a way to approach the studies. And so your patience and, and your interest is just very appreciated. So if you will, let's bow our heads. And uh, Gene, would you mind dismissing us in a word of prayer? Our Holy Father, we pray thy blessings on us as we study thy word, as we come to a better understanding of what thou has in mind for us, as we remember the promises we have from the other one which is to come. We pray that we might always look to thee for strength, to thy word for truth, to obey thee in all things, to trust thee in all things. We pray, Father, for the forgiveness of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs>